Yes, I was uh, something like 22 years old at the time and had already been made uh, put in charge of the uh, folklore, oral history, and social ethnic studies of the WPA Florida Writers Project. And uh, one day our state director, Dr. Corita Course in Jacksonville uh, popped out of her office and uh, called the editorial staff in and announced that Zora Neale Hurston, the black Florida novelist, was coming on board and was going to pay us a state visit. And um, that uh, she went on to warn us, uh, so to speak, that Zora had been fated uh, by New York literary circles. Uh, she'd already published at least two books and was consequently given to putting on certain airs, as Dr. Kors said, including the smoking of cigarettes in the presence of white folks, and that we would just have to make allowances for Zora. So sure enough, Zora came and Zora smoked and, and we made allowances. Uh, she did most of her work for the project uh, out of her home in Eatonville, and during the 18 months or so that she was with us and never had a desk to my knowledge. And uh, on occasion, Dr. Course would come out and ask if anyone heard from Zora, and no one had heard. And so she would look at me and say, you better write her a letter and jog her up. And I would do that, and by return mail, we'd get a very thick packet postmarked Eatonville, of the most beautiful folk songs and tales anyone ever saw before. And. Um, she was, of course, an extremely valuable uh, uh, adjunct of the project. Uh, she was our only published author. And in my opinion, her ear for idiom was uh, probably second to no other folklorist uh, on earth. And so that uh, her contribution in uh, immortalizing a, a black culture uh, is, you know, without equal, in my opinion. I recall uh, Alan Lomax, the preeminent uh, folk musicologist, worked with Zora in Eatonville as early as 1935. And he was telling me about how Zora had made him paint his face and hands black so they wouldn't attract too much attention to the white folks driving through Eatonville. And uh, he went on to say that in the field, and I certainly concur in this evaluation, uh, Lomax said that Zora was absolutely magnificent, that she could get anything out of anybody and she would honey up the men so they wouldn't ask for money. And sometimes she would honey them up so good that she'd have to jump in her beat up Chevy and run for our life to get out of the labor camps with the men in hot pursuit. As a folklorist, Zora was uh, uh, not only uh, resourcing people, but she was taking part. If it was a children's game, Zora got into it. Uh, skip rope or whatever ring game she was, Zora was right in there with them. So that uh, there was that sort of, uh, her records at the Library of Congress as a result, instead of saying recorded by Zora Neale Hurston, it says recorded and directed by Zora Neale Hurston. So she literally did direct her, her things. I think it's important uh, for someone to take note of the fact that uh, uh, black writers such as uh, Zora Hurston and Langston Hughes and Richard Wright were just beginning to be painfully aware that the so-called uh, black uh, Negro dialect, the this, that, these, them, those uh, thing, the Uncle Remus sort of language, was really a put down uh, on the part of uh, white writers. And uh, uh, black writers felt that they were obliged to follow suit when, when they started putting the language into uh, print. And uh, so these uh, writers in the 30s were beginning to say that let's cut that out and stick to idiom as a means of giving the flavor of, of black English. So that began in the 30s and has proceeded apace uh, to this day. Uh, the black English, in my opinion, uh, has, well, I said something earlier about the value of folk say generally in terms of being high articulate and succinct and a lot of other good things. But uh, to my mind, black English uh, needs to be credited with doing for the English language what uh, Yiddish did for the German in terms of making it lyrical. Uh, English is a pretty barbaric tongue and, and uh, blacks simply uh, weren't satisfied with it and proceeded to turn it into a poetic uh, thing that they could uh, make folk sermons and songs and things out of. 
so that I think there's a major contribution there that's been neglected, certainly. And the fact that Zora not only put her characters uh, uh, quoting, uh, speaking black English in quotes, and her folk songs in black English in quotes, but when Zora got ready to write an essay or a paper, uh, whatever, a uh, reportage, she uh, very often lapsed into black English very deliberately because, uh, of course, she was highly trained, had been uh, graduated from Bernard and went on to Columbia and Franz Boas. And uh, so that uh, when Zora wrote black English, it was uh, very much on purpose. And again, in my opinion, it's uh, something that should be encouraged. Black English as a mode of expression had uh, not existed in print except inside quotes up until that time, except in the form of the folk sermon. Uh, that was one form of public address where black English was certainly spoken and still is. But in the printed words, Zora pioneered in, in making use of it and having the courage to do it.